You're listening to the Jewel City Podcast. Make sure to rate the podcast and share with your friends. You can join us in person Sundays at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. We have something for all ages or online at 10 a.m. Make sure to check out our live groups or small groups. May 1st at 6 p.m., the Isaacs will be with us. You can get tickets at jccwb.org slash Isaacs or call the general office. In this podcast, we'll hear a message from Pastor Rita. Okay, this morning I really asked the Lord what to minister to you this morning. And this is my honor and my privilege. Of course, you know when you see me, it's going to be something different. Okay? And when I told my sister, when I told my sister what I had in mind, she said, oh, if I was you, I wouldn't do that. And I ran it by a couple other people and they raised their eyebrows. I ran it by a pastor and he said, what's wrong with that? <laughs> so this morning, the title of my message this morning is Good News from the Graveyard, The Great Escape. Okay, now, ever since my parents passed away, especially my father, I went to the graveyard every day. I'd never lost anybody really that I loved before, before I lost my father. I went to the graveyard every day. But every day that I went, all I saw was the fresh sod there. All I saw was the place where they had laid my father. There was no good news there. I went there so much, most of you know, they offered me a job there at the graveyard. And I began working there part time. But I'm going to take you to another graveyard eventually today. But I'm going to tell you that I've always been intrigued by magic. Okay, now not bad magic, not levitation, not black magic, not somewhere where we can't go. It's been kind of a sleight of hand type thing. You know, like, how'd he pull that rabbit out of his hat? Or uh, how'd he pull that quarter out of her ear? So um, there's been many, many great magicians, and there's been many great escape artists. Okay, in in many years prior and even today, we can watch magic on television. But if I say to you, who is one of the greatest magicians, one of the greatest escape artists that you know? Now, when I was researching, they named 10 or 12 right off the bat. Right off the bat, they had 10 or 12. But when I was interviewing people myself, I had a couple people tell me, David Copperfield, But almost everybody, whether they're young or old, said Houdini. That's right. Houdini was one of the greatest magicians, the greatest escape artist there ever was. So when I couldn't sleep this morning, another thought went through my head. I'm just going to give them a little sample of what intrigues me. Can I do? I'm not here this morning to lift up magic in any way. No way. I'm not here to exalt a man or a magician or escape artist. I'm here to lift up Jesus Christ. This is his day. Actually, every day is his day. Actually, every day belongs to the Lord. But today, he's going to shine all day long. I don't care if it rains, snows, sleets, or hell. Jesus is going to shine this morning because his buried body began to breathe. But I, I've, I want some volunteers here this morning. And the first, I typed this about 3.30 this morning, okay? Uh, we all trust Pastor Aaron, don't we? We trust Pastor Aaron. Pastor Aaron, I want you to stand over there. I want you to look at this envelope. Now, it's sealed, isn't it? It is. It's sealed, and it's got that little thingy, that little metal thing there. It's locked and flipped. I'm going to put him over there, okay? Now, I've asked for three volunteers, and I've already got them just to expedite time. They don't know what's going on. As far as they know, they have to stand on one leg and sing the national anthem, okay? Uh, My three volunteers, would you come up, okay? Now, you can see this is just a blank. <laughs> well, when you see Bruce, you know it's going to be fun, don't you? Well, I don't have to do that. <laughs> I hear the only thing you can draw is flies. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is just a blank. 
just a blank pad. I'm going, now what I want you to do, I've told each of you to have a pen or a pen. You each got a pen, okay? Now I'm going to ask them to write down three, a, a, a number. It's going to have three digits. You know, I don't care if it's 111 or 897 or 259, just as long as, and four people are going to have to write. So just watch there. So, yeah, no, yeah, just white, big, because someone's going to total these, okay? No, 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 no. Okay, give me that piece of paper. No, I, I want that so they won't think I'm cheating, okay? Three digits across here. One, across that way. Yeah. Three digits or four? <laughs> I'll, I'll just three. Okay. Think that I got past that volunteer. Okay, let's go over here. Mary, now you see, you can write right on write any number you want. Any number that comes to your head. Just any number that comes to your head. Let me see what you wrote here. Okay. Now you write. Now kind of keep them in a little bit in the column. Someone's gonna have to add these. Uh, I should have picked three more volunteers. I'm a smart one here. That's okay. scary. I got somebody adding them. Thing. Okay. Um, now, I just want to ask you one more time. Are these your numbers? Yes. Okay. Now, Aaron, you're holding on to, I'm going to shut this pad like this. These are their numbers. Now, you may sit down, volunteers. Yes. Now, I'm going to ask um, Linda, and I asked Linda because everybody trusts Linda. And because she's a teacher, okay, See the three numbers, okay? I'm going to ask you. You can use your phone or whatever you want to do, okay? Now, they, they picked the numbers. They said what they were going to write down, except Bruce did struggle a tad, okay? Jesus helped him. Okay, and, and can you give me the title, the, the sum, please? Okay, now these volunteers didn't know what they were going to do when they come up. And I had no idea what numbers they were going to write down. I had to help Bruce a time or two. Okay, Pastor Aaron, would you open up that and see what the, the sum is in that envelope? I taped it pretty good. By the way, while he's opening that, I will just tell you, I just got a, I did a DNA, Ancestry, I'm a third cousin to Pastor Aaron, and I did not know that. 1,658, is that right? That's right, very good. Hey! Now, that, that's just the type of things that interested me, okay? So, um, I'm gonna stick pretty close to my notes. Like I said, please understand that I am not lifting up a man, I'm headed somewhere. I'm going somewhere with this, okay? I wanna tell you just a few interesting facts about Houdini, and then I'm really gonna lift up Jesus Christ, okay? Houdini was born on March the 24th, 1874, and he died on Halloween night, October the 31st, 1926. His appendix ruptured and peritonitis set in. Indeed was a magician, but his, he was best famous and noted for his escape artist. He could get out of anything. He was found fame, and he was known as the king of handcuffs, okay? And some of his famous escape routes were the water torture cell, the straight jacket escape, the box in the river, dangling from tall buildings and bridges, handcuffed and bound, yet he always escaped. And I found out an interesting fact about Houdini that I did not know. He taught the United States soldiers how to escape capture during World War I. Okay, now here's where it gets a little interesting. On his deathbed, well, actually, before his deathbed, he and his wife one time joined hands. His wife's name was Bess. They joined hands, and he said, whoever dies first, me or you, I want the other one to try to come back from the grave, make a great escape, and come back from the grave. So they made some kind of a pack, and their, their code word was Rosabelle 
believe. That was just a code word that they were going to use. Okay, well, when peritonitis set in and he realized he was going to be the first one to die, he took his wife, Bess, by the hand and with some of his dying breath, he said, Bess, don't forget our pact. He said, I am going to come back somehow from the grave. I will escape, and if I don't do it right away, if I don't come back in the next hour or day or whatever, he said, on that date of the anniversary of my death, when I'm dead for one year, October 31st, light a candle and wait for me, I'll be back then. He did not come back. Houdini did not come back, okay? And it said that the next year on October the 31st, his death date, she lit a candle and waited by the window, but guess what? No Houdini, no great escape artist. He did not return. They said for 10 years she did that. She lit a candle and wait for him, but he never came back. Now, I just, I want us today to take a look at the grave of Houdini. This is the great Houdini's grave. Now, I know that we are limited in what we can see. We're very limited, and we certainly can't see down below. But, and he's been gone for some time. However, nothing ever looks disturbed. Nothing, it all looks the same as the day they buried him, except the grass has grown and, and all goes on, okay? But there is Houdini's grave. He has not returned. And I'm sure that if we were to open that, if it were disturbed in any way, all you'd find some rotten, rotten clothes and maybe a few dead men's bones. Okay, for 10 years, she waited on him. But today, I'm going to quit talking about Houdini. He kept promising his wife and his friends that he would come back, that he returned. Well, it's been since 1926, and he's not come back yet. He's still six feet under the ground. He has not returned. But today, this morning, I want to talk to you about a man named Jesus. I want to talk to you about a man that was born of a virgin, and he was born in Bethlehem of Judea. And I'm going to lift him up today, and I'm going to tell you that he went around doing nothing but good. When he realized who he was, he began to minister. Even at a young age, they found him in the temple. I mean, Mary lost Jesus. Mary lost the Son of God, and they had to go back to Jerusalem and get him. But he was always doing his father's business. And so I want to take you up until this season. Jesus did many miracles. We know the many miracles that he did, beginning with turning the water into wine, beginning on raising the dead and doing all these things. I tell people, and I say this quite often, that Jesus had trouble going to funerals. You know that? Because when he went to funerals, he would touch the dead or he would speak to the dead and they would rise. How many of you know when the dead set up, the funeral's over? Okay, so Jesus had trouble going. He would just touch people and he, he would come uninvited. He would go invited, but he would minister. And then came the day that they crucified Jesus. Now, I spoke the other night about the Last Supper. And when I spoke at John Spikers the other night, I spoke to you, you know that there were 13 men at the Last Supper. 13 men, okay? Jesus and his 12 disciples. And I know that Pastor Aaron had a picture up, and I so enjoyed his message the other morning. I so enjoyed his message. And when he had the picture up here, and I'm briefly, I'm not going to go there too long, but briefly, do you know that the table of Leonardo da Vinci is not actually true? That's not accurate. If you look out the window in his painting, you can see daylight, and really the Passover happened at night. If you look on the table, you will see fish. It was Passover, so actually it was lamb that was on the table and not fish. But, uh, and also, the table was not long. There was a triclinium table that they used back then and still use in most parts of the Middle East today. A triclinium table. It was kind of U-shaped. And the U, the open part of the U, would face the door always. That's just how it is in the Middle East, the, the open part of that triclinium, tri meaning three, clinium mean 
to recline. And we know that night at the Last Supper, we know where four men sat, we know for sure. And I won't go into that. That's not my sermon this morning. But I'm here lifting up Jesus Christ. We know that the guest of honor always sat over on this side, second seat, okay? Not the guest of honor, I'm sorry, the host. And Jesus was the host of the Last Supper. So he sat at the second seat right here. And then we know that the, the, the best friend of the host would always sit right here to his right. And he would always come bringing a sword with him. He would always have a sword and they would slide it under, or they would hide it, slide it under a rug or a carpet. Because if someone would come in that door that they were facing and threaten the host in any way, the best friend or the bodyguard would reach under the carpet and grab out a sword. In other words, the best friend was saying, I will lay down my life for this host right here. Okay, so we know that the, the best friend said here, the bodyguard, Jesus, and to the left of Jesus would be the guest of honor. And would you believe who Jesus gave that seat to? The guest of honor. Now, you can research this and Google this. We do know where the four men sat. To his left, Jesus gave Judas the place of honor the guest of honor. And so two men came to the Last Supper that night. Two men came with swords. Two men came hoping to sit to the left, to the right of Jesus. So two men came. You know who they were? Peter came with a sword. We know that. He used it in the garden. John came with a sword. So John and Peter came with a sword, hoping to be the best friend and the bodyguard of Jesus. So Jesus looked at John. He looked at Peter, and he said, John, Sit here to my right. So John was chosen to sit in the seat of the best friend, the bodyguard, and he slid the sword under the rug. And then Peter said, well, where do I sit? Okay, well, over on the far end, on the very end is where the foot washer sat. Always, you know, uh, usually when we go somewhere to eat, somewhere we can sit anywhere we want to eat. But in the Middle East, there's a pecking order. Okay, you don't sit anywhere you want to sit, and especially in those days, and they had no chairs, they reclined, okay? So Peter got to sit over here where the um, foot washer, and he was pouty. He was very upset that he had to sit over here where the foot washer was, and John got to sit by Jesus, and we know he was upset because at one time when Jesus said, one of you here will betray me, everybody said, is it I? Is it me? Is it I? And it was Peter that looked over at John and said, you ask him, he'll tell you. Okay, so he was a little PO'd. He was a little ticked, okay? But we do know about the, the triclinium table, and we know that night, and I could spend a lot of time there. There's beautiful lessons there, but, but I won't. But um, I'm going to take us on out to the garden. I want to take us to Calvary tonight, and I won't spend a lot of time at Calvary, but I just want you to picture, and I, I like to preach about Calvary, and there's so many churches these days that don't talk about the blood anymore. We don't sing about the blood anymore, and I was watching TV the other day, and they put several, and I was disappointed in some of the big pastors, some of the big, I won't mention their names, but I was just disappointed in some of the big pastors' responses when they would look, the questionnaire would look at these big pastors and say, is Jesus the only way to heaven? Is Jesus the only way? Is there only one way? And they beat around the bush. They just went around the bush and they never did say yes. But one woman in the audience stood up and said, I can answer that. There is but one way. There is but one door and his name is Jesus Christ. Yes, Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. One woman in the audience stood up and said that. So that's what I'm saying. Here's Jesus, the only way to heaven. No, they don't sing about the blood, but I want to take you to Calvary. I've been to Israel twice. I've seen Calvary. I've seen the place of the skull. They took Jesus. We know that the crown of thorns was on his head. I saw Pastor Aaron came to my house the other day to, to pray and, and, and to talk about some things. And, and I gave him a crown of thorns. And when he left, he must have stuck his finger or pricked himself and he grabbed back. And when he did, we both thought probably the same thing. All he did was just touch his finger and it, it hurt. 
Can you imagine getting these crown of thorns and putting them on your head and pushing them down? And the, the tips of these thorns were poisonous. So his brow began to swell. And as they nailed him, both hands and then his feet to the tree, can you imagine how it felt? And I said, I bet the blood ran down and got in his beard. I bet the tears ran down and, and, and everything and the sweat as he hung there on the cross. And he couldn't even get to his eyes to wipe his eyes. He couldn't even take his thumb and wipe the sweat and the blood out of his eyes, but he hung there. I understand that he hung there nude. I understand that he hung there, laid wide open his back. The commentaries tell us that when they finished beating him 39 stripes, that you could actually look in and see his entrails. You could see his backbone. But I, and I say that it wasn't the spikes that kept them hanging on the cross but it was the love that he had for you. He knew that one day there would be an Aaron Caton that would be lost and on his way to hell and Aaron would need a savior. He knew that one day there would be a Rita Robinson, there would be a John Spiker or a Rosie Kane that was lost and he hung there on that cross and we do know that as he hung there, they mocked and they jeered him and before they hung him, they pulled his beard. I'm, I'm talking about Calvary today because it's that season of the year on Friday, but I and I like it when it's, he stood before Pilate before they hung him on the cross. When he stood before Pilate, I love the response of Jesus. When Jesus said, Pilate looked over at him and said, are you really a king? Are you really who you say you are? And Jesus looked over at him and, and Mel Gibson's The Passion, he had that purple robe on and he looked so thin and he was beaten nearly three quarters to death. And he looked over at Pilate and he said, not right now, I'm not. But to this end was I born. I will be one day. One day I will be a king. And not just a king. I will be the king of kings. And so, they, yes, let's give Jesus a hand. Thank you, Jesus. This is your day. Death could not hold its prey. Jesus, my Savior, he tore the bars away. But he kept telling his disciples. He kept telling them. He said, you can destroy this body. But in three days, I'll be back. In three days, I will rise again. They weren't quite getting it. Okay, I want to say that in John 2, 19, Jesus answered and said unto the Jews, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. And paraphrase in Rita Robinson language, he said, boys, I'll be back. You can do what you want to with this body right now. But oh, in three days, it may seem like Friday, and then it's going to be Saturday. But come Sunday morning, watch out, because I am going to break the bars of death. I'm going to defy death, and I will rise again. Matthew 28, 5 and 6 is, and the angel answered and said unto the women, this is Easter morning. Fear ye not, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here. He is risen as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. I tell you, Jesus Christ, unlike Houdini, Jesus Christ made, he made good on his pact. He made good on his promise. Houdini said, I'll be back. He's not made it yet. But Jesus said, I'll be back. And he rose in three days, just like he said. The East story and the picture of the empty tomb when the women went to the tomb. And now I want to tell you, I want to see a picture now of the empty tomb. That first Easter morning when the women went to the empty tomb and they saw the empty tomb. And I want to tell you that not only did the women run to the tomb, but the, when the women ran to the tomb, there's the empty tomb. And I like it because it's not from the outside in, it's from the inside out. The tomb is empty. Now, I, I will say this. When I went, went to the, the empty grave of Jesus, I'll never forget the day that we got to step inside the tomb of Jesus. I, I went in, and I was so excited to go in. And our tour guide said, I've never seen so many people come over here and pay all that money just to see nothing, because there's nothing there. There's nothing inside the tomb. I enjoyed going inside the tomb and just looking around 
around and feeling the presence uh, of the risen Savior. But I'll tell you, I enjoyed it all over again and maybe even a tad more when I watched Indy come out. Uh, I'm telling you, when Indy came out, she raised some dust. Uh, I want to tell you that she, I'm telling you, I didn't know if the vegetation in that garden was ever going to be the same. Uh, she came out dancing and a shouting and a waving her arms uh, because Jesus is not there, but he has risen again and he lives today and he is at the right hand of the Father. And I found it interesting, the disciples didn't remember what he said. The disciples had no idea. They did not remember. Where were they? They were in Jerusalem, scared to death behind closed doors, scared to death. They did not remember. The only ones that remembered what Jesus said when he said, go ahead, destroy this body. But hmm, I'm coming back in three days. You're not going to get rid of me. The only ones that remembered were his enemies because they sealed the tomb and they put extra guards about him because this deceit said he was coming back. So we're going to see, make sure that he doesn't come back. But all they did was to no avail because you can't keep the son of God inside a grave. You can't keep him confined because on the third day, and this was planned since the foundations of the earth were laid, Jesus Christ came out of the grave. So on that morning when the women went and they were worried, who's going to, you know, we need some testosterone here. We need somebody to roll this stone away. We, we, we're not able. Who's going going to roll the stone away that we can anoint his body. But when they got there, I can see their eyes now. I just like to picture this. It's a bit chilly. It's chilly. There's still moisture and dew in the garden. And they get wet. They get their sandals wet. Their toes are wet as they're going through the garden. And when the leaves from the olive trees, when they hit them, they get all this all this water all over them. And they got their lanterns held up. They want to see. And they said, look, do you see what I see? The stone. Somebody's moved it. Somebody's moved the stone. And they were so excited. They were full of questions. They were full of excitement. They were full of, of amazement. What has happened here? And then that's when they ultimately saw the, the angels. It says in John 20, 4 and 9, that they that they saw some angels. And when they saw the angels, the angels began, whew, I thought he was coming back again right now. When, when he saw the angels coming, okay? So they ran and back to Jerusalem. I can see him now knocking on the door of the disciples. The disciples were behind these closed doors. It says, so they ran both together, John 20, four through nine, Peter and John and the other disciple did outrun Peter. Now, I want you to see this. Can you imagine? I picture Peter being older because John was the baby of the disciples. He was the youngest of the 12. He was the baby. So Peter was older. Uh, Peter was probably a little heavier. Okay, that happens when we age. Okay, and so Peter was running, but it says, at the dis but John outran him. John outran him to the tomb. And so when John got to the tomb, he got down and he looked in and thought, what is going on? What is it? But it said then not only did John outrun him, but when Peter got there, he shoved John aside. He said, get out of my way. And old Peter, you know Peter. He's always the first one to open his mouth. The only time he opened his mouth that was to change feet. Okay? And he ran right in past John. And it says, and they looked. And he came to the sepulcher. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying. Yet when he not in, then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeing the linen clothes like and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the clothes, but rather wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and he believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. You see, the women just went to the tomb. They saw the angels, and they just, they did not enter the tomb. But then when the disciples came back, they ran and they went a little further. And as I was preparing this message, that spoke to me. 
me. If we want more of Jesus, if we want to see a little more and know a little more, we have to go a little deeper. We can't stand out and just look in. We have to say, excuse me, but I'm going to get to Jesus. And you go in and find out for yourself. You know, I can, I remember, I, I just remember when my mother got saved. Well, I was only three. I don't remember that, but I remember sometime after that when she got saved. For a long time, Jesus was my mother's Jesus. Do you know what I mean? It was, it was my mother's Savior. But I remember the day, and I was sitting at the piano, 227 Ferry Street, when Jesus became my Savior. My mother's God became mine. And there's people today, like there's people all over this congregation this morning, good turnout for a sunrise service. But I'm telling you this morning, there's some of us here and some of you out there that know Jesus better than others. Why? Because you're not standing at the outside of the tomb looking in. You're saying, get out of my way. I got to get to Jesus. And those are the people in the New Testament that got answers, that got results, that got healed, that shoved the people out of their way and said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, if I can just see Jesus, if I can just get to him, he can change my life. How many of you know that one nod from the king can change your entire destiny? All you have to do is just go like that. He has to do, and he can change your entire destiny. So the two guys went a little deeper than the women, and sometimes we have to go a little deeper. Okay, what is to see what God is actually telling us. What do you see? Do you see just an empty tomb, or have you gone in and seen the place where the Lord lay and Jesus to you. Now, I want to speak for just a moment, and I know that some of you, or maybe all of you here know this, but I'm going to uh, share with you how many of you know the story behind the linen napkin. Do you know that story? Okay, a few of you don't, but it's Easter, so those of you that do, you're just going to have to hear it again, okay? When the men went into the tomb, okay, they noticed right away that the grave clothes were laying to one side, but the napkin, the napkin was neatly folded and laid to one side. That's what the word tells us. Now, for those of you that don't know, back in those days, there was a custom. Now, if you and I would walk into the empty tomb and we would see the folded napkin laid to one side, you know, we would wonder, well, what does that mean? The rest of the clothes are all messed up just like he come up out of them. Okay, but why is the linen napkin folded and laid to one side? Because it, the Jewish men of that day knew exactly what that meant. They knew without a doubt, and there was a triple, quadruple excitement that day because back in the days of Jesus, it was a Jewish custom that there was an understanding, it was an unspoken understanding between a master and his servant. That means when the master and his family were dining and eating a meal, if for any reason there was an interruption and he or they had to leave the table, the servant didn't know whether, are they finished? Do I go in and clean up? Or are they finished? Uh, do I wait till they come back and finish their meal? So it was a custom of that day. If the family or the master was finished, he would just wad up his napkin and throw it aside. But if the master was not finished, what he would do is fold that napkin, and it was an unspoken symbol to his servant to say, I'm not finished, I'll be back. And so when the men ran into the tomb that day, and they, and they were standing there trying to put it all together. I mean, he's gone. I mean, he, he's gone. And then all of a sudden, hope began to be restored. All of a sudden, and you know, I just know, when I watch the news, when, and then this morning I watched the news, I, I, I didn't really go to, I went to bed last night, but I didn't really sleep at all. Okay, and so when I watch the news, and it's so discouraging, then all of a sudden, when I remember today is Easter, 
Easter. This morning is sunrise service. He has risen from the dead, our Savior. This is the holiday. This is the day that we as Christians pin all of our hopes on. I'm glad he came. I'm glad he was crucified for my sins, but I'm glad, I'm ever so glad that he didn't stay there. Man, the grave is empty. He is risen indeed. And said, all of a sudden, hope. When the men ran in and when they saw the empty tomb, there was hope. But then when they saw the folded napkin, it spoke to Peter. Now, it wouldn't have spoke to me because I, I don't know the custom, but Peter knew the custom. John knew the custom. He stood there. I, I can just see Jesus. Can you picture him coming right up out of his clothes, grave clothes? He, he the, the shroud. He come right up out of him. And can you, I'd like to see him standing there in the tomb with his new body and neatly folding the napkin, sending a message to his disciples, I'm not finished, I'll be back. And he laid it aside. So there's the folded napkin. He's not finished. Now, here's the good news. Jesus, when they were going to crucify him, he said, do whatever you want to do. But in three days, I'm coming back. Okay? Now, in Acts 1.11, Jesus is standing on the mountain. He's about to leave. He's been here approximately 33 years, a little plus, and he's about to leave. And he's talking to his disciples. Go ye and tarry in Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. He's giving them instructions. But all of a sudden, he begins to go up, 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 up. And they're watching him go. I bet their heart is still full of questions. Well, where's his kingdom he was going to set up? I thought I was going to be part. And I can just see him going up in the clouds. And they block the sun from their eyes. Then all of a sudden they see angels. And an angel said, Luke tells us this in Acts 1. Ye men of Galilee, why stand you here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back again the same way as he has gone into heaven. So in other words, he's told us, okay, I'm coming back the first time. Now he says to you, he says to the church today, I'm in heaven right now, but I'm coming back again. And I'm telling you, he's going to make good on his promise. Uh, Jesus Christ shall one day split the eastern sky and he will come back for a church, for a bride without spot or a wrinkle. Right now, he is in heaven. He is at the right hand of the Father. And I got down here, number one, he's praying. Jesus is praying this morning. Do you know he's praying for you? He's praying for you. He's praying for each of us. Do you know that he's perfecting? He's perfecting. He's making gold out of you. Okay? He's making gold out of us. He's praying. He's perfecting. And he's preparing. He's busy building mansions. One of them's got my name on it. I'm telling you, I'm excited. He's praying. He's perfecting. He's pre and he is preparing. So I just want to say that in conclusion, some of the greats, there's been more than Houdini that said they were coming back. There's been a few of the other greats that says, I'll be back. They claim to return from the grave, but none of them ever did. No one ever has come back from the grave unless Jesus rose them, like Lazarus or whatever. Friday is over. Saturday is over. This is Sunday morning. And his buried body begins to breathe. He is alive and well. So I echo the words of the Apostle Paul. It's all about Jesus. Jesus Christ crucified, risen, and coming again. So this morning on this sunrise service here at Jewel City in the little town of Meadowbrook or Shinston, West Virginia, I bring good news from the graveyard that Jesus Christ came back like he said he would. He did leave again, but one of the last things he told us is, I'll be back. So he's coming back again. He's not only coming because he lives, I too shall live. So there's good news from the graveyard. The great escape, Jesus, the escape artist, has returned from the grave. Would you bow your heads, please? Heavenly Father, my heart is beating so. It's not because I'm scared, it's because I'm excited. I'm excited that I know the risen Savior. 
I'm excited that you returned and you came back just like you said you would. And I'm excited because one day you're going to return again and get us out of this mess that we're in. So on this Easter Sunday, the sunrise service, I'm looking out at the congregation. Maybe you came just because you're an early riser. Maybe you came for breakfast. Or maybe you're here because someone invited you. But before we close and we do go get something to eat, I'm going to give you an invitation. If you don't know the risen Savior, if you don't know the Savior that walked out of the tomb that morning, you see, the stone was rolled away, not that he could get out, but that we might look in that we might go in. He didn't need the stone rolled away for him to get out. But he wanted it rolled away so we could look in and say, the great escape, good news from the graveyard, he's gone. Is there anybody here this morning that does not know the risen Savior and you'd like to know him before you leave? If so, just slip up your hand right where you're sitting. I don't know this risen Jesus. But I'd like to meet him this morning. God bless you. You've been a very attentive congregation. And I say to you, Happy Easter. And before I sit down, we're going to try the early church thing one more time. He has risen. Say it like you mean it. He has risen. Thank you for listening to the Jewel City Podcast. Make sure to rate the podcast and share with your friends. You can join us in person Sundays at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. We have something for all ages or online at 10 a.m. Make sure to check out our live groups or small groups. May 1st at 6 p.m., the Isaacs will be with us. You can get tickets at jccwb.org slash Isaacs or call the general office.